proud of a strong dollar and it helps to keep inflation down as you noted last night but there is such a thing as the dollar being too strong at least for certain industries and exporters and so forth are you worried now that we've really reached the point given the uh, escalation of the dollar in recent weeks that the dollar really is overvalued now well what I'm more concerned about is that of course it's overvalued in a concern in if you compare it to other currencies but I think where we should be looking are to those other currencies. And obviously our recovery is way ahead of theirs. And obviously they're still burdened by some rigidities in their ways of doing business and so forth that uh, I think are going to have to be corrected. Mm -hmm. And what we're hopeful of is an increase in the value of theirs. I think the, the danger of trying artificially in some way to uh, force the value of our dollar down uh, puts you back, as I said last night, in the, in the uh, uh, inflation in spiral. Right. But we did intervene a little while ago, too. Yes, and we've done that from time to time where we think there's disorder uh, threatening the, <laughs> the, the marketplace. And uh, so that has been done. It could be done again. Uh, yes, yeah. But not primarily to drive the dollar down. No. Just to, uh, do you think that the Federal Reserve should ease monetary policy to allow the dollar to decline? No, I think the Federal Reserve right now is doing what we believe is, uh, is proper, and that is uh, to see that the money supply and the growth in it is commensurate with the growth in our economy and uh, so that, that, so that growth will continue without uh, inflation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chairman Volcker says that the Fed has stopped easing monetary policy, at least for the time being. Uh, how would you respond if, interest, if the Fed lets interest rates start rising by, say, the spring? Uh, well, I would not like to see them do something to encourage their rising. And the tendency has been, as you know now, for uh, a period back, uh, to drop, and I'd like to see them drop further. And that too would help, I think, in the uh, balancing more of the currencies of our trading partners. You'll be going to Bonn in May for the Economic Summit. Um, what do you expect the main issue is going to be there? Well, I think it'll be a continuation of uh, what we've been talking for the last uh, couple of, of those sum summits. Uh, some of it will be, I'm sure, a discussion of about how we uh, uh, can institute another round of trade talks to uh, come closer to a, a free market place and get rid of protectionism wherever possible. Mm -hmm. I think that's as vital to them as it is to us. Mm -hmm. But it's, again, it's going to make them look at some of their, their own structure and uh, some of their government practices, just as we have looked at ours in the last four years, and look what the changes have, have brought us. But the strong dollar is likely to increase protectionist pressures in the United States, isn't it? It might, but uh, it would be the wrong way to go. Are you growing at all impatient with the Japanese government uh, on, on uh, trade concessions from them? Well, this is the wrong time to ask me that now because we are uh, uh, entered into uh, uh, ongoing discussions with them about uh, making the market uh, uh, open both directions. And uh, I have to say that uh, Prime Minister Nakasone has been most cooperative. Like me, he has a government structure in which he can't just give orders and uh, have things happen. Uh, so he'll be running into uh, confrontations about uh, what he wants to do. But I know that he believes very much that as the uh, two economic powers that we are, that uh, there is a risk in the imbalance of trade that we have between us, and we have made some sizable progress with them on trade matters and on the basis of opening their markets, uh, 
or making them more open to uh, our own exports. We have, what do you think is the most substantial concession they've given us? Well, I would have to say in agriculture, the opening to uh, beef and citrus uh, was uh, very definite. Uh, the, uh, the voluntary uh, uh, restraint that they, they themselves adopted uh, on their own about uh, automobile imports when that industry was so hard hit here. And, uh, Are you inclined to, uh, to have that expire? Um, <laughs> well, it's voluntary uh, on their part, and as I say, I would, uh, I'm not ready to discuss that yet, but uh, we'll have to treat with it and deal with it in the context of the ongoing overall talks that we're having with them. Which includes telecommunications and financial yes. services and the whole. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Lee, why don't you go ahead? I'd like to ask you a domestic question. Um, you've just named Beryl Sprinkle to head the CEA. Um, I'd like to know what your thinking was. Why did you choose a rigid monetarist, um, especially since Mr. Sprinkle has been a very harsh critic of Fed policy? So doesn't this move raise the specter of some renewed turbulence between the White House and the Central Bank? Well, no, I don't think so. Uh, He's taking a position to be my economic advisor. And uh, I, I think that's what his function will be. On the other hand, we've, uh, I've had criticisms in, of past performance when the uh, money supply has either gone one way or the other and uh, or held, for example, too tightly for a time. Uh, and uh, I've been willing to speak my mind on that. I recognize at the same time, however, that the tools the Fed has to work with are not very accurate. I mean, they, uh, they're not that precise. And you, uh, you can't look at uh, the fluctuations. So you, you have to look at a kind of a long-term trend in which way they're going. And as I say, I'm satisfied with what they're doing. Well, there's still a question of why a supply-side president would have a monetarist CEA chairman <laughs> and uh, a follow-up. Uh, do you want to change the role of the CEA in any way from the uh, Feldstein era? Well, I won't discuss it with relation to what any other era has been. I'll only say that I want it to be an advisory group to me. I want their advice, and I want it given to me. I don't want to just have to read about it someplace. Okay. Why a monetarist? Huh? Why a monetarist? Well, no, I, uh, I think that there's a, there's a place for that also. Uh, on another personnel matter, uh, Ray Donovan has been on leave of absence from the Labor Department since October. And it now appears that he faces the prospect of a protracted criminal trial on corruption charges. Um, isn't it time that the Labor Department had a full-time secretary? I just don't think you can walk away from someone who has been as unjustly treated as he has. And uh, I have every confidence in him, and I'm not going to do anything that would indicate that I don't. The, the budget battle is underway on Capitol Hill, and the Senate appears to be moving toward adoption of a budget freeze that would include uh, a one-year hold on cost of living adjustments for Social Security recipients. Now, in light of your campaign statements on this subject, will you work to kill that provision? <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to see what happens there. I, uh, I have said on occasion, and I don't mean to say this to be taken in any way that I'm retracting or trying to prepare the ground for drawing back. The pledge that I made during the campaign, in my mind, was aimed at repudiating the charges that I was out to reduce uh, the benefits that Social Security recipients received. Uh, I frankly had not thought about whether this had anything to do with the increases. Actually, I don't think that's such an important thing. Um, if you look at it honestly, first of all, inflation is so low that that isn't a, uh, 
what it has been in the past with double-digit inflation. But the second thing is, all this dwelling in Social Security ignores the fact that Social Security is not contributing to the deficit. It is funded by a payroll tax which can only be used for that purpose. And if you lower the cost of Social Security or the outgo, it just simply reverts to the trust fund. Actually, I don't know why Congress ever put it in, uh, in a unitary way in the, uh, in, in, the, the in the budget and made it unitary with the budget. If, if ever there was anything that belonged out here on its own, it is that, that well, program. In the um, question about taxes, in, in 1981, you were personally down in the political trenches fighting for your tax bill. The administration's new tax reform proposal has been public since November. And so far, uh, the White House hasn't taken the lead in forming a pro-reform coalition. Why are you hanging back? And uh, how do you expect this bill to pass without that kind of personal involvement? Oh, we don't. And we're going to be that personally involved. What we haven't been able to convince anyone of is the fact that our first requirement was the budget. And uh, there's no way to describe the hours that we have put in in the meetings on that subject alone until we were ready with a budget proposal which we have now submitted to the Congress. But said over and over again that then we go to work because it is a dual track thing uh, with this whole problem with the deficit and government overspending. Now we will do the same thing that we did with the budget. We have not had time uh, or had a single meeting on the Treasury proposal. Now overall, from what I know of the overall view of the that proposal, I've said that I think it's the best tax study I've ever seen. But it also contains a number of options, and just like the budget, when we went over them point by point, we're going to have to look at these, and there may be some things that we believe are not wise and that shouldn't be in there, but we're not ready to go to bat with that until we stop talking about uh, the generalization of the plan and come down to specifics and say, all right, here is that proposal and here is how we want it passed. Well, uh, on the plan, you know, you assert that um, you can slash corporate tax rates uh, and still keep the plan revenue neutral by uh, making companies that currently don't pay taxes start to pay them. But since the Treasury's tax plan raises business taxes by $165 billion over five years, isn't it a little implausible to assume that sums of this magnitude will only be raised by making a few industries pay more taxes? Well, the truth of the matter is, uh, the figure is somewhere around $100 billion a year of tax that we believe legitimately should be connect collected and isn't being paid. Now, that wouldn't all be business tax, but it is a sizable amount. There are, in addition to the rates being cut, however, remember also that uh, there are, are going to be changes, not only for business, but for uh, individuals with regard to cutting off exemptions. But we find that for the individuals, for example, uh, uh, they still come out with a tax uh, rate reduction. Okay. We think that in addition, there is another thing that we uh, have seen in the past that will happen. We think that this proposal and the lowering of the rates will make the whole business of tax shelters uh, not as attractive. It just won't be the reason to go out searching for them. Uh, a final tax question, and I think we'd like to move to foreign policy for a bit. Um, Treasury Secretary Baker says it will be four to six weeks before he decides on whether to draft a specific tax bill or send Congress a general statement of principles or opt to work informally with the Congressional Tax Writing Committees. With that kind of a slower track, um, aren't you running the risk that Congress will turn to tax reform too late to pass it this year? No, because there's nothing in that that's going to be retroactive. And there is another plus, too. Um, we've had an experience of having taxes and budget cuts uh, both at the same time and seen uh, people on the hill that then wanted to start trading from one to the other. We didn't want that and don't want it, but it isn't a case of deliberately holding back. 
What he's going by is our experience with the budget and how long it's going to take us now to sit down and really work out what, in what form that Treasury proposal we want to send up there. Mr. President, shifting to foreign affairs and specifically Nicaragua, whether you wanted to or not, you made some news at your recent press conference by yes. suggesting that the U.S. was broadening the political objectives in Nicaragua by uh, keeping the pressure on until the Marxist government there either was dissolved or agreed to power sharing with the dissident movements. My question is, how can we justify helping to what appears to be overthrow a government merely because we don't like its political coloration? Well, because here again, we all of us find ourselves, because they call themselves a government, accepting that, all right, this is the, the government of the, uh, of the country and of the people. This is one faction of a revolution that overthrew a dictatorship. And while we weren't around then, uh, this country made it very plain that uh, we had no objection to that overthrow. In fact, we immediately uh, before, and this was before my administration came here, this country started to provide sizable financial aid to the revolutionary government. Yes. But then it developed that just as Castro had done in Cuba, as I said last night, uh, one faction got in and muscled the others out. Uh, some of them were jailed, some were driven into exile, some are up there leading the freedom fighters now. And there is the fact of the promise they made to the Organization of American States that in return for their help, uh, this would be a legitimate democracy. Uh, I think we have to ignore this pretense of an election that they just held. This is not an elected government. This is a faction of the revolution that has taken over at the point of a gun, and the people haven't had anything to say about it. And I think that under the UN Charter, under the OAS Charter, there's every reason for us to be helping the people that have indicated uh, they want the original goals of the revolution to be instituted. And sir, if you're frustrated by not getting Congress to go along with you on aid to the Contras, we still do a fair amount of trade with Nicaragua. Would you uh, go along with the idea of imposing economic sanctions on Nicaragua? You have the authority to do that without Congress's approval. Well, I'd rather not discuss uh, anything in the line of tactics of what we might or might not uh, do uh, as this continues. Mm -hmm. Moving then to El Salvador, there's the war there it seems to be grinding on with no clear victory on either side. Uh, how much longer will the United States begin supporting the Duarte government until uh, before some, something positive seems to be coming out of it? Are you getting impatient with the pace down there? No, and uh, we wish it could be uh, faster than it is, but actually there has been improvement. Uh, there's been improvement in this government in the, and in the El Salvador military. Uh, they have been making more progress uh, than they have in the past against the, uh, the guerrillas. And what I'd like to see also happen is Congress uh, join now and support a multi-year imposition of the, well, I call it the Scoop Jackson plan that that commission uh, came back with aimed not just at a particular country, but aimed at, in the whole area, uh, making those countries more economically sound, more self-sufficient, give them economies that can begin to improve the scale of living of their, of their people. Mm -hmm. And just as it's with us in the past, we have tried, uh, our aid has been about three to one uh, social and economic uh, compared to military. And that the same ratio per, uh, pertains to this other plan. But the idea of having an extended plan, just as we did with the Caribbean Initiative, in which someone doesn't just say, well, uh, they're doing this today, but what are they going to do tomorrow? They can look ahead and, and plan ahead. Mm -hmm. I apologize for jumping around the world no, so much, sorry. but moving to the Mideast, <laughs> uh, partly in response to US pressure, the Israelis have begun their withdrawal from southern Lebanon. And in the ensuing vacuum there, the Shiite Muslims are moving in and people are saying southern Lebanon is going to become another Iran. Does this bother you and uh, what does it mean? Would it be a major setback for our Mideast, Mideast policy? Well, it's, uh, it has to bother anyone because uh, that's a quite radical faction that is moving. And uh, we have to remember, though, that the very thing that 
uh, we set, went in there originally hoping could be resolved was the differences between factions. Uh, that uh, radical faction is matched by uh, the Sunni Muslims, uh, and they have their own forces, and then there is, of course, the, the Christian militia and the others. But it's our hope that the, has been our hope that the government of Lebanon can somehow bring a reconciliation between these various forces and uh, begin to have a government where, like in our own country, uh, people live together in peace, mm -hmm. regardless of their uh, religious differences. In switching rapidly to the Southern Pacific, the U.S. is considering severe retaliatory measures against the New Zealand government in response to that country's refusal to allow our Navy ships to come into harbor. Uh, are we overreacting or are we worried more about the severity of these, this response and the impact it may have, say, if the Japanese follow suit? Well, no, we're, what we're doing is more in sorrow than in anger. Uh, how can you have an alliance, uh, the ANZUS alliance that we have, if then one of them chooses not to participate or to cooperate uh, when a part of your alliance uh, is based on uh, maneuvers and, and practice about uh, ensuring the security of the area. So what we've simply done is just canceled out any, uh, mainly what we're doing is canceling out any of the uh, joint maneuvers that we were going to hold with them because if we can't go into their harbors, it, uh, it's a little ridiculous. So. We've just set that aside. We are continuing with ANZUS, with Australia, and... Uh, uh, and you're not concerned about the impact that uh, the Japanese may perhaps do the same thing? Uh, because they have a ban against nuclear weapons being in their ports, too. Oh, uh, but I think we have a better relationship now with them, and uh, uh, they have even increased their own military defense capacity because they recognize the need for full cooperation. Lee, why don't you? Well, we can't let you go without a political <laughs> question or two. Um, you've refrained from endorsing Vice President Bush for the uh, 88 presidential nomination, but uh, many of your top staffers seem to be voting with their feet <laughs> and uh, moving to the Bush camp. Uh, doesn't this amount to a sort of powerful, unofficial signal by your White House that Bush is your man? Well, you'll have to ask the people who are moving and all. All I can tell you is that uh, uh, we have a very healthy relationship, more so, I believe, than has been customary in the past by, uh, between presidents and vice presidents. And uh, I just, uh, I don't feel that this is the time to be getting involved in uh, anything of that, of that kind. Uh, it's a long ways away, and we've got an awful lot of important things to do in these next four years. But aren't you worried about the prospect of some very bloody intra-party conflict uh, between possibly uh, Mr. Bush's establishment backers and the so-called conservative populist followers of uh, Congressman Jack Kemp? Well, I'll tell you, uh, back in California, we had a very successful program that worked, and uh, I believe in it uh, even at the national level. And that is, obviously, you are going to have contests. Obviously, you're going to have uh, primary uh, challenges against each other. But in California, we tried a thing that was called the 11th Commandment. And I would like to see it instituted uh, in the coming elections, 86 and 88, at a national level, and the eleventh commandment is, thou shalt not speak ill of another Republican. Now, it's possible to run, and you run on what you believe, and you run by not attacking someone else, and it actually worked in California. There you go, bringing the Bible into politics. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. All right. It sounds like you're missing a good party next door. Um, yes, I, well, I'm supposed to drop in there. And, uh, that's right. Great to see you again. All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. Oh, that's right.